Hey, peace to everyone in the chat. Uh, welcome back to the Black Brain Trust. This is episode 227. Hey, please click the like button as you come in. Share the video if possible. Um, there's a document in the description beneath the video for you to follow along with. <clears throat> I see people coming in, so I'll give people at least 90 seconds before we get started. Um, See who's in here now. Um, Richard Dixon, what's going on? Charles Watkins, what's going on? Infinity M Invictus, what's going on? Um, we don't have an email address for advertising. Um, never really thought about that, but if you want to get in touch with us, um, We'll drop the uh, email into the uh, chat shortly. Just to give a synopsis of uh, what's going on today and um, what's been happening all week, uh, we got sidetracked with, uh, you know, some other stuff that um, was not pertinent to our best interest of the Black Brain Trust, so we had to get back on focus. This hangout was supposed to happen on Tuesday, but we got sidetracked from other things that were um, not of um, our interest, our best interest of the Black Brain Trust. So um, now we're back doing business um, as usual. So it's BAU uh, for those of you in the, in the uh, corporate field. And tonight was just about um, talking about decolonialism in Africa. Uh, there's been a lot of um, discussion going on about decolonizing Africa from the Europeans. But then there's also discussion about uh, the new colonialization of um, China. From my perspective, I think the two are apples and oranges. You really cannot compare the two. Um, so but we'll focus on the decolonization part first. I think that's more important um, at this point. Then we can actually discuss on an, maybe on another stream China um, in the in the uh, Sino colonialist uh, agenda. All right, let's get started. Um, so basically, the continent has gone through many changes of uh of hands and spheres of influence uh over the last few centuries and what's in you know important to, to discuss from the top just at the high level is colonialism you know what is colonialism uh, a lot of people talk about colonialism you know anti-colonialism uh, decolonization decolonialism so the question you know is essentially what is colonialism at the high level. And colonialism at the high level is basically the governing of of a nation state or, or a territory uh, <clears throat> through policy in military action. Um, basically, you're, you know, big fish take little fish, so to speak. So, That's colonialism in a nutshell. Uh, and so where have we seen colonialism? Um, the past few centuries, we've seen it with Europeans, Europeans' expansion um, into, into the continent of Africa, into Central Asia and South, Southeast Asia, um, and into the West, uh, such as the 
um, North American continent as well as the South American continent and the Central American continent. So you've seen this great expansion by Europeans through militarism, uh, uh, militarism to take over territory that actually does not belong to them, uh, that they're not even indigenous to. Uh, it's not like, uh, you know, the Native American, the indigenous population of, of the North American continent you know, was occupying, you know, Europe with teepees and, and bows and arrows. That that didn't happen. So why the justification for such a uh, harsh uh, harsh treatment of people, black, brown, and otherwise, you know, in, in these places in these places that they are they are not um they are not indigenous to themselves. Um the exploitation I'm sorry, I just got distracted by some of the comments in the chat. Um, Alvino Allen says, uh, or ask, you know, um, I wonder what it is at a low level, uh, cultural influence, media control. It's it's called soft uh, soft influence. So soft influence, the NBA, the NFL, um, the illusion of Hollywood. That's that's all the soft influence. Hey, please hit the like button as you come in. Brooklyn Star, how are you? Good evening. Um, so that's colonialism in a nutshell. Um, not anything really scientific or um, really complex at this point. We've seen it with our own eyes. And then we see it at the micro level, not just the macro level, right? So we see the micro level of occupying black neighborhoods, brown neighborhoods with um, law enforcement, laws that are created by the colonialists and enforced on the, oppre on, on the colonized people. And that means that you're using law enforcement as a bulwark against a defenseless population. So you see colonialism not just from a nation state and uh, um, a military perspective, but you also see it from a economic and and a uh, judicial perspective, right? So judicial would fall would 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 be where law enforcement falls under because law enforcement is the arm of um, the system itself. So um, basically, colonialism is happening as we speak right now. Um, we see uh, French colonialism all over Africa, well, in, in major parts of Africa. And you're wondering how we got to this point. Um, a lot of the people don't, who, who are maybe asking this question may not understand the Berlin Conference, which comes to item number two on the docket, um, the Berlin Conference of 1884. Um, to 1885. So the Berlin Conference basically had all European powers sit in one room and decide the fate of, of the continent itself and cut it up into a jigsaw puzzle to what we see today. Um, the borders in Africa, as we see on the map today, are artificially drawn by uh, European powers. This is not new information. I'm just kind of rehashing um, what's already publicly known. And let me share my screen. So what you're looking at on the screen is, is the partition of Africa. And from the 1885 to 1914, so 1885 was the, uh, February of 1885 was the final uh, meeting on colonial, uh, of the Europeans and their colonialist agenda on Africa. 
So if we start from the top, which is the British controlled territories of Africa, um, you'll see that um, Nigeria, Egypt, um, Sudan, uh, Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, um, and South Africa, um, all all uh, being colonized by the um, by the British, and then we see the French taking the majority of, of this territory from from the continent as well, colonizing this territory uh, with Mali, Algeria, and Morocco, all of that region, and then we see the Gabon. Um, in equatorial uh, uh, Africa as well, so in Madagascar. So we see all of this um, uh, carving, of, carving up of the continent um, at a conference. Germany taking over, uh, you know, uh, pieces of pieces of the pie itself. Um, the Portuguese and their influence over uh, Angola and uh, Mozambique, Cape Verde. Um, And then we go down to the Italians, and the Italians having influence over Libya, what we know as Libya today, uh, Eritrea, and Belgium over Congo. And we also see um, the uh, Spanish having influence within uh, West Africa as well. And, you know, uh, Ethiopia being independent, they were the only ones who were able to make it out. So uh, Alvino Allen asked, why, I always wondered if colonized people get to such a staggering point of defenselessness uh, defenselessness. Why not just kill them uh, us off? Why bother with all the manipulation? Because you still need. I mean, where where are you going to put all these people? Um, it, keep in mind that before they put the Jews in the Holocaust, you know, the uh, Second Reich um, actually put uh, Africans into their own Holocaust in the 1880s. So we know that. Um, that's where they practice it first. So before the, before there was Jews being put in ovens, you know, <laughs> they were slaughtering Africans as well. Um, only 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 a half a decade or a half a uh, century before that. But what were they going to do with all those people? Right? It, it's not easy um, to get rid of all these people. You need a lot of um, um, <laughs> you need a, you need people who can actually stomach getting rid of that many human beings and, and unfortunately for a lot of um for a lot of militaries that's not easy um you see it's happening to this very day a lot of u.s soldiers come back and they're not the same as they once were when they left so you know they see certain things and it and it makes them kind of um i should say it introduces ptsd to them so a lot of the morale of your soldiers uh tends to wane after after a certain amount of time even just after one incident so why not get rid of all of them? They they really didn't have a mechanism to do that. I mean, other than to starve them out, like they did to uh, the um, Indians in Sub-Saharan India, uh, where they the British actually starved them in the 1890s or the 1880s. Um, that was their own Holocaust. Uh, starve them out and watch them um, die from famine. So. All right. Um, so let me get to some of these uh, items on the docket. Third item on the docket. All right. This one is from News Dakota. Africa's colonialist or colonial history explains country's present challenges. When former colonizers claim they're due, they get repaid. 
But when Africans do the same, they are told to forget about the past and look to the future. It is well known that Africa is home to most of the world's poorest countries. Last year, the newspaper USA Today published a list of the world's poorest countries. It showed that 18 of the world's top 20 poorest countries are in Africa. In developed countries, people frequently attribute Africa's problems to corruption, lack of good governance, and civil wars. Undoubtedly, there is some truth to these uh, accounts, but they do not tell the full story. Many current African issues are not unique to the continent. Corruption exists all over the world, and civil wars have taken place in developed countries too. Yet the economic consequences of such plights are generally of much greater magnitude in Africa. The question is why? Corruption is not an African way of life. One can argue that the level of, say, corruption in African countries is higher than it is in Western countries. That argument is not far-fetched. But it is far-fetched to believe that high, uh, heightened levels of corruption are simply a result our, of our culture. That it is simply the African way of life, to be corrupt or in state of constant disagreement. It is, it is inconceivable that a group of people spread across 30 million square kilometers of land with very little contact with each other could have adopted a similar way of life by chance. Clearly, Africa's economic struggles might be, must be rooted in something else. Consideration of Africa's colonial history offers insight. Most African countries possess enormous reserves of natural resources. However, to this day, decades after they gained independence, many of these countries do not have real ownership of their resources. Gold mines in, in South Africa, coal mines in Madagascar Zim, in Zimbabwe, and diamond mines in South Africa, to name a few examples, are owned by companies listed on non-African stock exchanges, such as London Stock Exchange. Foreign ownership stems from economic control that countries like Britain, one of the con Africa's biggest former col uh, colonizers, had over natural resources in Africa. During its years as, as a colonial power, the United Kingdom deprived African countries of the economic advantages of their natural resources. Trade with Africans was almost non-existent. African, Africa's resources were exploited for the purpose of ex export. Colonial powers will sleep reap the benefits of past advantage. Today, the Western or the West countries to reap the benefits of the past advantage in the form of transfer of wealth through inheritance laws and the absence of systems to redress the past destabilization of uh, African economies. The story is slightly different for former French colonies. These countries are still tied by the neck to France. Most of them continue to pay tax to France for infrastructure developed by France in their in their countries, and most pledge military allegiance to France and use a currency, the CFA franc, that is pegged to the euro. France put these tactical advantages in motion when negotiating the independence of its colonies. Burkina Faso or Senegalese taxpayers, for instance, help pay for train stations in France rather than schools in their own in their countries. France justifies the arrangement, saying that saying it helped develop these countries' infrastructure, but this infrastructure was not built to build benefit Africans. It was, help, it was built to help France export these countries' natural resources. In effect, when the French government claims it's due, they get repaid. But when an African does the same, he is told to forget about the past and look towards a better future. Of course, the terms negotiated between former colonizers and colonies were always bound in, down to favor of uh, the oppressor. How can militants who knew nothing but force effectively challenge the masterminds that had controlled most part of the world for decades? The colonizers always had the upper hand. And so they exploited the African people who were more than happy to accept their terms in the name of peace and independence. 
On top of that, this independence was awarded to leaders who had no, no experience running countries. So once again, what role does col colonialism play in African economies today? Of course, modern issues like corruption are a factor, but many of, the, many of our issues are rooted in Africa's colonial past. So, and France being the, you know, the biggest beneficiary of, of uh, colonialism in Africa, um, I, I find it very ironic, you know, their perspective on life, um, considering that they always lose wars. Um, so we see based on this article that a lot of Africa's issues are not rooted in Africa itself, but rooted in colonialism and past colonialism. Alvina Allen says, I'm willing to bet France's colonies are the only thing keeping them afloat right afloat now. Yeah, you're right about that. It is. But that those days are slowly coming to an end. Probably probably in about ten to fifteen, if not twenty years, um, you'll probably see that stop. Mostly because uh other countries are becoming bigger and stronger. All right, let me get to this next article. Uh, we got 35 people watching and 28 likes. Um, if you're not going to participate in the chat, please hit the like button. All right, this one is from Ozzy.com. The book that shook France's African colonial empire. Over six rounds of voting, the Academy Grand Court in Paris couldn't hit decide the best French novel of 1921. Then on December 14th, a deciding vote cast by the organization's president broke deadlock and shook the Francophone world. The pre-Grand Court, France's top literary award, had gone to René uh, Moran, a, Moran, a French Guy Guyanese colonial administrator in Ubunguay Shari, what is today the Central African Republic. Moran was the first black winner of the then 18-year-old award. But as civil rights and anti-colonial movements were uh, stirring, it was the continent, it was the content of Moran's novel that truly set off tremors on both sides of the Atlantic. You build your your realm of dead bodies on dead bodies, wrote Moran in the pre in the pre um in the preface to the book. Batuala, you are living a lie. Everything you touch, you consume. A searing indict indictment of French colonialism in Central Africa, the book was an insider's account that forced France to confront the reality of its civilizational mission. Much as Joseph Conrad's Heart of the Darkness had lifted the veil on Belgian brutality in the Congo two decades earlier. The French parliament debated the book, with some accusing Moran of defamation and others arguing that he had exposed exploit, exploitation. Several French writers criticized the academic Van Court, with some predicting Batuala uh, uh, would soon be forgotten. They were wrong. Moran's own career as a colonial administrator ended soon after and faced with threats of retribution. He returned to Paris in 1923, but he became the pre he became the African point of reference for writers of the Harlem Renaissance, according to the French expert on African American studies, Michael Faber or Michel Faber. Uh, all right, Michel uh, Fabre. W.E.B. Du Bois, 
wrote about Moran and Batwala in the crisis, the NAACP's magazine, while a young Ernest Hemingway, writing in Paris for the Toronto Star Weekly, called the book Great Art. Anyways, I'm not going to read too much of this. Um, this is actually something that you guys can read on your own. It's actually really good stuff. Um, actually learned a lot just from um, just from reading it myself. All right, let me see what you guys are saying in the chat. I'm here alone tonight, so. D.E. Raptor, what's going on? All right. All right, this next one is from aljazeera.com. The Rise of Hipster Colonialism. Last week, Germany's Africa Commissioner, Africa Commissioner, uh, Gunter Nuuk, said that European countries should be allowed to lease land and to build and run cities in Africa as a means of stemming what he views as the unchecked expansion of mitigation, of migration from Africa to Europe. But Nuuk, allowing the free development of these areas would stimulate African economies and create growth and prosperity and therefore reduce the attractiveness of Europe as a destination for migration. The proposal has elicited mixed reactions. Some have seen it as a novel economic uh, proposition to stem a complex political strategy, uh, political challenge. Building on existing economic arrangements like special economic zones, says, and economic uh, processing zones, they argue that this would simply be this next stage in the evolution in the idea that economic exclaves that protect industries from the ravages of the open economy are the best way to stimulate growth. Now, instead of jeans and sneakers, we want to optimize people or at least labor by protecting them from the realities and ravages of their society. Understandably, there has also been considerable pushback. The word colonialism has been raised, with critics arguing that Germany, especially with, with its history of violent colonialism and genocide in Namibia, Cameroon, Tanzania, and Togo, has no moral authority to even table such an idea. More broadly, Many African countries are still struggling to recover from the damage from European colonization. In many African countries, land tenure is still irregular and skewed to uh, to wealthy and often white minorities, uh, engendering generational economic exclusion. Many African uh, economies have failed uh, to move beyond the extractive labor intensive economies they inherited from their European counterparts. The violence of colonial uh, colonization is still very present in Africa. Should we really be talking about a new trendy colonialism that only re- really hopes to address Europe's paranoia about a possible invasion of black bodies? The easiest way to get to the heart of what's go- what's wrong with this proposal is to go back to the basics. What is colonialism and why is it bad? The dictionary defines colonialism as a policy or practice of our acquiring full or partial control over another country, occupying it with settlers and exploiting it economically. We talked about that earlier. Ultimately, it's about exploiting a power differential in order to reorganize one society for the economic and social benefit of another saying that one society economic and social imperatives 
are more important than the others. So Nook, so Nook's proposal is fundamentally hipster colonialism, attempted to reclaim colon, uh, colonialism by couching it in neoliberal trends or ideology, um, ideology while advocating for a return to an essentially exploitive system of social and economic organization. Many of these uh, speaking in favor of this proposal do it in a sterile and agnostic terms. For, uh, focusing on the economic dimensions and potential financial growth and leaving out the most important element, the people involved and, uh, and affected. Underneath this is a reductive premise that human beings and Africans especially, uh, specifically are not fully uh, actualized human beings who deserve holistic life experiences. Africans are just labor in, or labor or economic opportunities. Yet human beings are just are not just labor. We are complex and so, social and interconnected beings who whose needs cannot be who cannot just be uh, collapsed into a money. We do not want to be reminded that it is we, the indigenous people, who are poor and exploited in the land of our birth. These are concepts which the which the black consciousness approach which is to eradicate from the black man's mind before our society is driven into chaos by irresponsible people from Coca-Cola and hamburger culture, um, cultural backgrounds that Steve Bickle, the founder of the black consciousness movement in a leading light in the anti-apartheid movement. Uh, Bickle Rightfully observed, the rightfully observed that uh, colonization and apartheid were about more than process of economic disruption. Even while even while that process specifically centered on the alienation of land was traumatic enough, colonization was also about mental de degradation of black people in in South Africa. The apartheid system was about breaking down the spirits of black people so they that they could be malleable and even amendable to a system of political organization that kept them deemed powerless and even ashamed in, in their own home. Colonization is about unmaking one society for the benefit of another. More urgently, Nook's hipster colonialism is only attractive if you ignore history and indeed reality. Some facts about migration to Europe especially uh, easily challenge its flawed premises. Nook doesn't go to the heart of the economic and political climate that make migration an attractive alternative for young African people. What are they fleeing from that would make near certain death on, on the sea a more attractive alternative to home. Nook has nothing to say for a massive land expo expo expropriation by Western uh, corporations and Middle Eastern governments of a war on terror that has criminalized young black male young black malehood across the Sahel and down Africa's eastern seaboard of an international political system that supports and sustains autocracy in pursuit of stability. More broadly, African cities are already performing many of the functions that Nook's uh, economic enclaves claim to work towards. Privileged people are already able to access better facilities, opportunities, and representation than their rural or urban poor counterparts. This hasn't stemmed the flow of migration. It has just created a power differential between the urban elite and the poor, in turn exacerbating problems like insecurity and state violence against the poor who are criminalized through the process 
of protecting the privilege for the few. European schools and universities are clearly failing to educate their students on the underlying social, cultural, and structural violence that made uh, colonization possible. It's a fascinating coincidence that the that <clears throat> that this con conversation is happening in the shadow of the death of an American missionary attempting to take a vintage colonial uh, uh, civilizing mission to North Sentinel Island in India. The Sentinelese, a society last contacted by outsiders in the early 20th century, responded to the unsolicited, unsolicited invasion with a volley of arrows that almost uh, that almost instantly killed the young men. We are reminded that the civilizing mission of European uh, colon, uh, colonialism was ultimately an in, invasive, violent process. Dehumanizing neoliberal hipster colonialism is being proposed so liberally and uncritically that it is easy to lose sight of what makes economic, um, what makes colonialism toxic. Human mobility across the Mediterranean is indeed increasingly dangerous, and that requires a robust, coordinated, and concerted effort to resolve. But we can't ignore the reality and history as we throw around variations of old policies rephrased in modern, trendy language, because such half-baked solutions will inevitably compound whatever problems we seek to resolve. Ultimately, Hipster colonialism and Nook's proposal is yet another reminder that we need to recenter people in our policymaking. It can't just be about money, and that the road to solutions begins quite simply with reading a history book. So, hipster colonialism, where have we seen this here locally, right? So, part of cultural intelligence is being able to relate. Um, across across multiple different cultures and your situation and their situation. Um, we, how we see hipster colonialism in the United States and urban cities is we see these new pale-faced millennials with their beards and their tight skinny jeans and their chains on their hips holding their keys and wallet um, buying up property in predominantly black neighborhoods um, for pennies on the dollar and then gentrifying the neighborhood and then saying that this is good for society or or the local local economy. So we see this sort of hipster colonialism happening here even in the United States where um again um these uh people come in and try to redevelop the environment so that it's better uh, allegedly better for those people on the ground who have stake there um, through culture, but are being usurped through economic policies such as, you know, um, redlining um, and other other methods of of uh, gentrification. Woman of the past, how are you doing? Good evening. D. E. Raptor. Good night, my friend. Um, I don't, Mike. I heard, I heard this very same words, not not in German, but from a speech in the House of Lords in London. Mm -hmm. That this Lord got up and stated that the way we can help Africans is by getting 99 year leases on land throughout Africa and building all these cities and how it's gonna bring economics because they can hire the African. And uh, the Af they be providing employment for the African. And I said to myself, I said, look what this, these jokers are not going quietly into the night. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you call it gentrification in America. Mm -hmm. But when when it's done in Africa, what can you call it? I mean, here you are. You they started all these wars all over the planet, all over the planet. People that are coming to America. Mm -hmm. But if you see the investors that are moving into South America, mm -hmm. or you see them after the war start in Africa and Middle East, mm -hmm. you see the investors from Europe moving, or the, the wealthy people from Europe moving into the Middle East mm -hmm. and to Africa, and the Africans moving to Europe. Mm -hmm. Is there something wrong with that picture? Do they know something that's going to happen in Europe that these people don't know? Well, know, a lot of people don't know Europe. If this so-called this so-called um, mm -hmm. what do they call it now, um, they want you to, to believe that this thing is caused by man, but it's a it's a, it's a, it's a cycle the Earth goes through. Mm -hmm. They call it global warming. And then climate change. And if it continues, Europe is going to be underwater. People don't, people never study this. The Dutch built dikes. I mean, they have a bigger dike system than what's in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. The Germans too. Black people are going to Europe thinking that Europe is the panacea, not realizing that the Europeans have a plan. This is not something, the article makes people believe that this is just an accidental thing. One guy suggesting this foolishness. It is not. This is a plan. They, they sat down and worked out this plan. Mm -hmm. Because Africa got the resources that they want to build whatever they want to build. Mm -hmm. If you want to get off this planet, the resources that you need, not in Europe, and most of it is not in America. Where do they have to get it from? Africa. Exactly, bro. They might want to mine the comets when they get out there, but to get out there, they need the resources that are in Africa. And Africans better watch it because nobody is paying attention to this. They're not looking at it as a plan. This guy who wrote this article is not looking at it as a plan. And he's not telling people, hey, there's this plan to get you out of your land so that they can come in and take it again. Mm -hmm. It's not by guns this time, but with paper that is not worth it. It's not worth the the paper that they're gonna give you now is not worth the value because they can always change the paper. They can come up more and say, you know what, we get rid of the US dollar, we're gonna name it something else, and we're gonna devalue it and start all over again. Mm -hmm. Nobody's paying attention to this. I'm I'm hoping African leaders are looking at this they got people who are looking at these things but yeah they they uh there's a uh, gentleman who was at the um uh world economic forum from africa um he's he's actually a very common um face in, in the uh african economics and um and geopolitical uh strategy and he had talked about something similar to what you were saying but i also wanted to relate it back to America to uh, a, uh, ADOS, hashtag ADOS, uh, American Descendants of Slaves, where they're seeing this locally, right? Um, and you brought up gentrification, um, which is something that I talked about before, but the international term for gentr gentrification is IDP, right? Internally displaced people. So in America, black people are internally displaced by colonialists on the ground, right? So again, these hipsters with their thick beards and their skinny jeans and their um, their converse on, you know, with these trucker hats and these uh, fake glasses, um, you know, they, they, uh, they're, they're coming into these neighborhoods um, and they're getting property for pennies on the dollar, especially in places like um, New York City, um, Brooklyn and, and the Bronx, um, and they're cleaning it up and then they turn the property into million dollar, uh, uh, million dollar, two million dollar, you know, condos and whatnot, and that displaces the people on the ground. And then those uh, those black and brown people have to leave and go somewhere pretty far away from the city, um, 
<clears throat> even sometimes out of the state. I've seen black people in New York get moved all the way into uh, into New Jersey, in Connecticut, uh, which is absurd. I mean, yeah, you can make it back and forth if you're willing to sit in traffic for so long, but uh, you're so disconnected and so you know disjoint from the uh, cultural aspects that you've already established that it's you have to start from scratch. Uh, we got enough time between now and the next article to, to, to really expand the listen. Your, your mic broke up. Can you say that one more time? Do we have enough time between this and the next article to to expand a little bit on this? Um, yeah, we can spend another five minutes. Okay, because there are a couple of people in the chat. Uh, Mr. Benevolent nigga, down man, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. It is not crazy, bro. Mm -hmm. For you hearing it the first time, it might sound like it is crazy, but it's not crazy at all. It's like um, when you see policemen in America killing black men, mm -hmm. when you see it happening, you, you're wondering, man, this is crazy. Why is it happening? There's a reason why it's happened. There's a plan behind that. There's a government policy in place that allows it to happen. And the State Department, not the State Department, the Justice Department goes around to police departments, teaching them how to get around being prosecuted when they kill a black man. The district attorneys are briefed on what they should do so that police officers can get off. This is a policy. This is not accidental. Mm -hmm. And Kenneth L says, can black folks invest in Africa? Yeah, you can. Even if you don't have any business sense, if you st start going to Africa, you don't have to go spend a year there. Just go there a couple of weeks a year. Pretty soon you'll see what is needed. And then you come back to America, you make your money, you spend 10%, invest 10% in it in Africa, not your whole 100%. It's like you invest in the stock market, you invest money that you can lose. So you invest, you build your business over there, and you go back and forth in the beginning before you move there permanently. Let it be some kind of trade that you are, you are selling kind of product that you can import or export either to the US, to China, to other African nations, mm -hmm. African states, not nations, African states, because this, this thing is a state thing. Africa is a continent and there's state, not nation. African is African. There's no uh, other than African and Africa. So when you start going there and you see the need for something, then you come up with a plan to provide that need, and there goes your business. And, and um, we, we also have an African in the chat, a uh, woman of the past, if I remember correctly. She is an African herself, so she can speak um, to some of these issues that are happening in uh, North Africa. So, well, let me get to this next article. All right, this next one is from the Washington Examiner. How progressive neocolonialism seeks to keep Africans in poverty. Uh, DE, please mute yourself. There are 640 million people in Africa who have no access to electricity, and extreme environmentalists in the West aren't pleased with the methods of Africans are using to lower that number. A recent report from the group Oil Change International laments the process African nations are making, or the progress African nations are making in utilizing more fossil fuels in part thanks to fund, funds from China and the World Bank Group. African countries and <clears throat> many countries in Africa are confronted with issues of energy production. Algeria and South Africa have reserves of shale gas, much cleaner than coal, which could be extracted via fracking. Affordable energy is the lifeblood of a healthy and growing economy. Yet oil change 
International would rather Africa not develop its own affordable energy despite the benefits uh, for these uh, needy countries. The group describes oil, gas, and coal as sources of global warming. Human rights abuses, war, national security concerns, corporate globalization, and increased inequality. Unfortunately, even the United Nations warns against shale gas extraction in Africa, empowering environmentalists in their opposition. In short, left-wing left -wing first world activists want to govern Africa their way. Heaven forbid they give way to what the locals want. And it's not just with energy. Food is another area. Hunger and starvation affect an estimated 230 million Africans. One, access, uh, one success in the United States has been the advent of genetically modified crops, GMOs, which can be bred for traits such as drought, uh, drought resistance. But this technology is also the bane of ideological environmentalists who view it as tinkering with nature. Genetically modified crops have struggled to maintain a foothold in Africa, despite their ability to help alleviate the fa uh, famine, pests, and disease issues that ravaged the continent. One environmentalist group, Action, Action Aid, has a hand in poisoning the debate through scare tactics uh, directed at Africans. Representatives have warned of the serious risk of accompanying genetically modified crops and claim the crops would surrender the African farmers' sovereignty over their food system to the corporates. However, multinationalists are not attempting to control the food supply. A representative of one biotech firm clarifies that their work is being done for the public good. We put technology in open pollinated plants so that the farmers can save their seed, do their own crosses, there isn't going to be a tech free or royalty associated with, with it. After Zambia's president declared a genetically modified food as poison and banned, it, and banned genetically modified food relief uh, received from other countries, the country endured a famine. A significant example, this uh, should encourage environmentalists to consider the human lives next time they uh, make their recommendations. The leftist uh, pattern, <laughs> patternism also extends to the wildlife management. Recently, strident animal liberation groups led by PETA or PETA and the Human Society of the United, uh, United States, uh, Humane Society of the United States, were in an uproar over Trump administration's decision to allow the import of small number of safari trophies, reversing an Obama-era ban. Safari hunts are a controversial topic. At first, at first glance, it seems uh, counterintuitive, but trophy hunting has actually been beneficial to conservation efforts in Africa. A century, a century ago, the white rhino population of South Africa was pushed to the brink of extinction and then carefully brought back to up to uh, 800. Subsequently, managed trophy hunting was introduced, creating an incentive for landowners to have rhinos of their on their land and increase the protect increase and protect their habitat. If there's no reason to protect them, many Africans view animals we we love, elephants, lions, etc., as pests that destroy crops and prey on livestock. Today there are two hundred there are twenty thousand white rhinos in South Africa one of the biggest conservation success stories on the continent. If PETA had its way, this would never have happened. Africa has suffered a great deal due to its history of being at the mercy of colonial powers. Today's left, with its twisted and patronizing form of neocolonialism, think they know what's best for Africa and want to impose their vision on the continent. But Africans deserve the right to self-determination Free of misguided Western do-gooders. So, neo-colonialism. Um, 
something that Western powers always impose on non-Western states, more importantly, Africa, the Caribbean, and Latin America. You see this sort of neo-colonialist agenda happening in Venezuela. You also see neo-colonialism on the ground locally in America when it comes to the public school system, where they can dictate what they think is best for black and brown students that go to these local schools. You see it happening even in policy where they say, we should put a basketball court or a playground here and spend your public tax dollars on a playground that costs five, 10, 15, even $20 million for a basketball court or a football field that doesn't get utilized uh, for more than 50% of the day and that this is the return on investment, this is good for you. They try to shove it down your throat. And they do the same thing with Africans, and which is what this article is talking about. D.E. Raptor, do you have anything you want to say to this? No, the article explained it clearly. I mean, if you're watching anything that has to do with the, the way colonialists act, and, and they're, not just, they're not just one set of colonialists. There's some who do it by war, and it's the same people, but they use two tactics, maybe three sometimes, war or money. The guys who uh, use the money, they, are, they, they call them environmentalists, they call them, uh, they make it look like uh, they are there to save the land, mm -hmm. you know. But when you save the land, who are you saving the land from? Mm -hmm. The people on the land. So you got to look at this thing carefully. You know, you got one guy who's shooting guns at you, and then the other guy comes and say, "You know what? We know how to fix that problem." Mm -hmm. But guess what? Both of them want to get you off the land. That's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. All right, let me get to this next article. All right, this one is from News Dakota. <clears throat> My reflections on the scars of African colonialism. The African man is in, in a, is in an impossible situation. He is neither the man before the colonialization nor a true Westerner. He is lost in a chasm between two worlds. The process of decolonization has led to great struggles for Africans to reclaim their freedom and sense of humanity. Colonialism no longer officially exists in Africa, African countries. From the 1950s to the 1970s, Belgian, British, French, Portuguese, and Spanish colonizers withdrew to let Africans manage their own affairs. Formerly, the African, Africans regained the independence they had long wished for. Yet, even today, it remains difficult for many Africans to return to their original values. The reason for this is that the colonizers did not just temporarily occupy the former colonies, they left their imprints on them. They mark their seals on the political, economic, and cultural affairs of the decolonized people. Consequently, the colonizers may be gone, but they are not really absent. Their ideology persists in us, with the consequence that many Africans act towards themselves as the colonizers did. Sounds familiar. Many Africans hate themselves. For instance, many black African women hate their skin color. They depigment themselves at the cost of traumatizing their bodies, all to look like the white woman they consider to be the embodiment of I ideal beauty. Let me read this one more time. Many Africans hate themselves. For instance, many a black African women hate their skin color. They depigment themselves at the cost of traumatizing their bodies all to look like the white woman they consider to be the embodiment of ideal beauty. 
Many Africans despise their mother tongues in their clothes. They gladly swap traditional attire for ties and warm suits that are appropriate in European in Europe's frigid winters, but not in African on torrid temperatures. In his book, Black Skin, White Mask, French psychiatrist and philosopher France Fanon wrote, this, wrote that the shame of being himself makes the black African a black skin being wearing a white mask. An African man thus finds himself in an impossible situation. He is neither the man before colonization nor a true Westerner. His, uh, his conscience is torn between Western ideas and African values. He is disinherited from the initial culture, but has only the crumbs of the colonizer's culture. He is a man lost in the chasm between two worlds. It, it must be said that we do not have to choose between living in Afri living an African life and a Western life. We must live in the African way. We need to stop making it seem like living in the Western way is an achievement. Pan-Africans, such as Patrice Lumumba, Ahmed Sekou uh, Touré, and uh, Cheikh uh, Ensa Diop, Marcus Garvey, and many others encourage Africans to relearn what they know about each other. They say that by understanding African Africa's history. Africans can make the cultural weapon of their former colonizers, their, re their religion, education, language, and political system obsolete. We must aspire to acknowledge, uh, to knowledge and then mastery. But doing so is not as simple as it may sound. We must recognize that it is not um, through isolation, relying only on our knowledge, that Africa will develop. As Le Grande Royale observed in L'Aventure in Bigui, when she extorts, when she exhorted the, um, I'm not even going to try to uh, butcher this, uh, a Senegalese tribe characterized by their attachment to traditional values to emancipate themselves, I, La Grande Royale, dislike Western school. I hate it. My opinion is that we must send our children there, though, so they, so that they also learn to win without being right. In fact, education is a weapon that, once acquired, can be a weapon to reverse the established repressive order. It gives the power to the oppressed to either chase the oppressor or to work as equals. In other words. Africans must assume their identity by becoming the masters of themselves and their own wealth. But to do this, we must first aspire to acknowledge and then to master their weapons that enable the West to colonize African nations, namely science, technology, and philosophy. Well, where have we heard this before? Sounds like there's a channel on YouTube called the Black Brain Trust. We've been talking about this since day one. Let me reread it again for those in the chat who have not heard. In other words, Africans must assume their identity by becoming the masters of themselves and their own wealth. But to do this, we must first aspire to knowledge and then to master the weapons that enable the West to colonize African nations, namely science, technology, and philosophy. Hmm. D.E. Raptor, you have anything you want to say to that? Yeah, the funny thing is that the West is built on African. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> you see, the, the, the three things we need, and one of those footstools is African already. So the science and technology, um, even though we are living in a, in a time when, when um, 
We're using what's called blockchain. Mm -hmm. The technology and science is built on African technology and knowledge. So while we have to learn modern, the modern uses of the technology, you got to realize that it's all built on African. It's not. Uh, don't lay back and say it's all African, so it's ours already. No, it was taken from us. And now we have to go back and relearn, not, not much as relearn it, as add what we don't know to what our forefathers knew. We also have to learn what our forefathers do because a lot of us don't know that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us hate having to learn that. You can hear it from people who say, you know what Africa got for me. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. But we have to, we can bring, like in the case of, say now, technology has got to a point where you don't have to go to France and immerse yourself in the French culture to learn that technology. You know, uh, Linnell is always telling, <laughs> giving us information about how, where to get information on blockchain. Mm -hmm. You know, everywhere here, we give information about, about, I mean, look at Nagon in the chat right now. He can teach you how to make money on the stock market. Mm -hmm. Just by, you know, Dollar Will, if he was here, he can teach you how to make money in the stock market. These are guys who got the information, willing to give it or tell you where to go to get it. So the African doesn't have to actually go to Africa to get it. He can also build the schools and have professors, whether it be African American or, or, or what we call British African, to come back to Africa and teach them the same technology. You know, that when you go to France, like France, what France and the British did is they immerse you in their culture. You learn British history, French history, you use the French French um, money, <laughs> use the British money. So you are essentially, like the article says, black man on the outside, but European on the inside. Your thoughts, what, what you are taught. Like the, like the women changing their skin color, that's all that's left. Mm -hmm. And they're here too. Thoughts, <laughs> what's it? What's your mind has been, uh, you know, uh, taken away from you? The only thing left now is the color of your skin. And the African women are just like mm -hmm. you said, Mike. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually heard that they, women in Ghana. I was talking to this one Ghanaian brother. He said that women in Ghana, in fact. Um, many women in Ghana have skin bleaching creams, man. They're, they're bleaching their skin up. They're bleaching their skin up in Ghana, man. I'm like, oh, what? What's up? Yeah, Jamaica has the same problem. Yeah, well, Jamaica's fucked up. I mean, you know, a lot of Jamaicans, they're, they're, they're just fucked. But, you know, I'm just saying as far as, um, you know, people from Africa itself, you know, Jamaica's got a tremendous, you know, skin issue problem you know you have the syrians and then you had the chinese who were in their um history and then you have the white man and you know you have got like siaga and all these guys you know the, you know the, you know you know the, the the mixed up people and you know my, my my ex-wife was was uh was west indian jamaican and she was fair complected and you know they have immense skin 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 issues there as much as they you know they wouldn't like, like them either. so you know as far as it makes concern they're all fucked up but but um but Africa itself, you know, Ghana, wow, you know. Um, and then I remember the guy, from Nat a brother from Native Born, uh, he and his wife, and one day he was doing a little bit of an expose and saw this as well. And, and uh, it was kind of surprising to see that. You know, he was speaking on that as well. Not positive, but pretty negative as far as I was concerned, to see that black people there in, in the mother, in mother Africa Bleaching their skin up. Hmm. Well, uh, yeah, skin bleaching is one thing, but um, I, like art, I don't, I don't know how much you've heard of the article, Nagon, because um, I, no. I, I read the whole thing. But um, the last paragraph refers, and I'm going to read it one more time. It says, in other words, Africans must assume their identity 
by becoming the masters of themselves and their own wealth. But to do this, we must first aspire to, to knowledge and then to master the weapons that enabled the West to colonize African nations, yeah. namely science, technology, and philosophy. Yeah. Sounds like the Black Brain Trust here. Sounds sounds like it, and, that, mm-hmm. and that's that, that, that's that's a key role. You have to you have to mask that because yeah, so I think so many of us are are littered with with the white paradigm from a standpoint of them being actually superior in many ways. We 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 have bought into a great degree of that, and um, mm-hmm. you know that does adversely affect us as well. It, it, it does. I mean, we can sit down here and say that it doesn't, but. But it does. We, 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 we do suffer from that. We do, we do deal with that. And it's on the continent as well. So, yeah, what you're talking about and how we need to evolve from there is, 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 is very, very, very important. Um, and that's something that you, got, you, know, you do talk about here in the Brain Trust. And that's bottom line. I'm, I'm totally with it. Mm-hmm. Now, see, Nagol, uh, yes. one of the things that you, you mentioned the, 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 the Caucasian being superior. But it's not him that's being. It's not him being superior so much as the technology itself. Ho 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 ho! I didn't say anything yeah. about them being superior. I said many of us think that. Think I, right, right. Think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Many, 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 many of us. Think, I heard what you said. Think, you think yeah. it's superior, yeah. but if you, if you look at them carefully, it's not actually that they are superior. No. But it's the technology that they have is superior, and technology is something that always. Uh, improves, you know, it's like it evolves, right? It all, yes, it will go yeah. from it will go from Africa into Europe, and the uh, and, and the Caucasian will take it and look at it and change it to adapt it to his surroundings, his circumstances, and then he will sell it back to Africa. And African will look at it and say, "Look, oh, he sell the Chinese thing in this triangle." Say, um, "Oh, you know what?" If we take this and add this to it, we will make it more to today's market. And then when, when they sell it to the rest of the world, the rest of the world is going to take it again and make it, you know, make those little changes, you know, adjustments and sell it back to someone else. That's the way technology works. Yeah, I mean, th- th- this, is, this is going on for time in, in, in memoriam. I mean, exactly. I mean it's, this is going on a very long time. Um, some cultures have hid technologies from, from, from others, like um, the Chinese had, very interesting, they had a, they had a Gatling, uh, a, a, a literally a Gatling arrow gun mm-hmm. um, that uh, they hid from the Europeans for 1,500 years. <laughs> I mean... You know, you know, they had guns basically that fired projectiles, and you know, they had, uh, you know, so other, th- you know, uh, other cultures came up with some of these technologies, and and they they adapted them differently, hit some of them, but gunpowder wasn't really used as a as 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 a as a tremendous weapon in war, uh, but you know, you know, the Caucasoids, you know, uh, adapted it for. for for warfare, and uh, you know, people seem to forget that the Caucasoid they um, they were basically defeated by the Mongols, and the only reason why they you know we, you know the Mongols didn't take over all of Europe was because the Great Khan died, and then they retreated back, and you know the white man has been fighting. Just see that, and that never happened again ever since. Um, and that was in the 12th century, so you know. Um, <laughs> You know, that's what we're kind of looking at. So superior, no, I don't think it's superior. I think uh, they've been a lot more aggressive than blacks have. But I think one of our biggest issues in Africa was that we were, um, we were xenophilic as opposed to being xenophobic. So, you know, um, we, we were very open to bringing foreigners into to, to Africa. They were, they were very open to bring them in. And I think that was a, you know, and then that was a big problem. Same yeah. thing with the Native American. Yeah, Native American thought the same exact way, same mindset. Yeah, yeah. so um, you know that that was that was a big problem. You know, black people had gold and you know silver and wealth. And Mansa Musa literally moved up and down. You know, left Africa from Ghana, went across uh, from the Mali Empire, and went to Europe, suppressed the price of gold around the world, or just on his tour. That's the kind of wealth we had. 
and um, it was a great deal of power. But uh, you know, um, we, you know, we were very xenophilic, very xenophilic, and uh, and, and that's what happened. Now people tell you you were you wasn't shit, you didn't have anything. We were reading and doing all kind of things before charting the stars, many things. It is what it is. I mean, you know, um, so that should be a lesson we we, we should we should be thinking about. And um, you know that's something. That's a message I know, Mike, that you you push heavily here in the Brain Trust, of, of which um, I, I, I embrace greatly as well. Mm-hmm. All right, let me hit this last article and then we'll open up for solutions and um, closing arguments. This one is from Al Jazeera dot com: How to truly decolonize the study of Africa. Uh, from Cape Town to Cairo, uh, Bahia and, and Bombay. Recent calls. Uh, mute Recent calls to decolonize the university have gained traction across the globe. These demands correctly challenge the legacies of colonialism and attempt to subvert them in institutional structures of higher learning. But the problem with the 21st century scholarly de- uh, decolonial turn is that it remains largely detached from the day-to-day dilemmas of people in formerly colonized spaces and places. Many academics mistakenly maintain that by screaming, decolonize X, decolonize Y, ad nauseum, they will miraculously metamorph into progressive agents of change. Some tragically believe that by ignoring leading uh, leading thinkers who were decolonizing long before it came a fad, including Edward Wilmot um, Blyden of Liberia and W.E.B. Du Bois of the U.S., who were prominent as early as the mid to late 1800s, they can carve out decolonization as their scholarly uh, fiefdoms. Still, others erroneously contend that Decolonial street cred uh, credibility can be acquired by simply adding non-whites to their reading lists, journal ed- editorial boards, speaking panels, research collaborations, book contracts, etc. Sounds like the manosphere. Despite these flawed pr- assumptions, 21st century uh, eps- ep- <laughs> Epistemic uh, decolonization cannot succeed unless it is bound in support of a contemporary liberation struggles against inequality, racism, austerity, patriarchy, um, autocracy, homophobia, xenophobia, uh, ecological damage, militarization, impunity, corruption, media muzzling, and land grabbing. For those who research and write about Africa, this is particularly important given the continent's fraught relationship with itself and the outside world. Though Africa remains captured today by the same forces that fuel colonialism, African activists and artists have responded by commanding revolutionary change. Before the phallus agenda uh, gained prominence, uh, most recently at universities in South Africa and Ghana, with demands to remove the statues of former impor- um, imperialists like uh, Cecil Rhodes or those with racial uh, biases like uh, Mahatma Gandhi. There were successful calls to topple co- continental autocrats, including uh, uh, Z- uh, Zain Ben Ali in Tunisia, Hosni Mubarak in Egypt and Blasi uh, Kampouri in Burkina Faso. While Egypt has regressed to even more repressive leadership in Burkina Faso battles in security in the Sahel, no one can negotiate. No one can negate the heady winds of change that have swept across the North and West Africa in the past decade. Some activist movements have endured more than others. In Senegal, for example, Yen A. Mari, Fed Up, Enough is Enough, a collective of rappers and journalists rose to prominence in 
in 2012 when it mobilized the public to vote out the then president um Wade who had manipulated the constitution to seek a third term in office its success inspired Rama uh Thiar's brilliant film The Revolution Won't Be Televised an old to Gil Scott Heron's uh, popular 1970s song poem. Earlier this year, uh, Yen A. Maurice returned to play an important role in Senegal's presidential election. In Tunisia, seven years after the country's revolutionary uh, revolution dignity, people took to the streets again in 2018 asking uh, Fek Nastanu what are we fighting for? Dissent was imp- uh, was prompt this time by the austerity measures imposed by the International Monetary Fund (IMF), in which taxes were raised, public sector spending frozen, civil servants' uh, wages slashed, and 22% of the country's budget allocated for serving servicing debt. Meanwhile, a new revolution has swept I- Algeria and Sudan where mass mobilization managed to unseat two long-term rulers, uh, Botflika and al-Bashir. Aside from demanding accountable governments, Africans have recently pushed for the removal of the colonial-era penal codes criminalizing homosexuality, while Angola, Mozambique, and the Seychelles relaxed anti-gay laws in the past few years, in the past five years. Last month, the High Court of Kenya upheld a ban on same-sex relations. Despite the ban, initially challenged in 2016 by the Kenyan National Something Something Commission, Kenya has seen a rise in LGBTI advocacy. What the fuck is an I? This is the this was the most apparent in the overturning of an embargo on the critically acclaimed. Rafiki, a film about a young lesbian couple whose director, um, Ranui Kahui, sued the government for censorship in 2018. While current crusades to rid the continent of colonial laws rage on, actual decolonization in some parts of Africa persists. When the International Court of Justice, ICJ, ruled in February that the UK must return uh, Chagos Islands to uh, <clears throat> Martyrice, uh the nation scored a symbolic victory. This verdict exposed the UK's unlawful retention of the Chagos at Indep- Independence in 1968 and the deportation of its inhabitants who have been battling to repatriate ever since. London has since refused to respect the advocacy, non-legally binding uh, position of the ICJ, International, well, anyways, um, basically, the way to decolonize Africa is to um, restructure in the educational system and the policies. Uh, what's your take on this, um, Nagon? My take on this whole thing is to really decolonize Africa. Is to African con- the African, you're going to have to have an African, um, uh, what I would call, um, common union or, um, you know, or, uh, or federation of African states, if you will. The name of the game is to hang together. Hang together politically and economically and begin to squeeze mm-hmm. the, the, the foreigners out. That, that's the real answer to this, mm-hmm. is to unify the continent politically and economically through a, not through just one political party, but through a federation, and to really unify it through a common currency, through a fiat dollar based, backed up in their own gold and outside of anything else. Mm-hmm. And that's what, in my view, would start to really unify that and begin to um, uh, remove the colonial um, um, 
uh, uh, influence still from a business perspective of which, you know, would bring about in some respects rumors of war. But this is what would have to be done. That's kind of really what Libya was really all about. And that's why they were handled the, the, the way that they were, because they were in a position to really rally around that. Um, the, the Francophone states would have moved um, outside of that and moved into the uh, more of a Libya, of, of, of a Libyan, um, um, under Libyan kind of market Lusophone states um, that are, you know, Portuguese run would, would certainly have fallen, uh, fallen and, and gotten underneath that. And that, you know, you're talking about some European states having a huge problem. So that's so. So quite frankly, in order to counter with the Europeans, you have to counter that same thing with the same kind of um, with, with the same kind of medicine. Hang together, and when you start to, uh, Doctor Gerald Horn speaks about this, you know, um, uh, in, in 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 some detail on uh, some of his, some of his, some of his good reads. But uh, you know, we, we can talk about that in depth a little bit later. But 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 that's what what. what what would what would be for me a real answer um, to that to that issue, um, and that's something that that the African states I think are slowly moving towards this, but um, I would like to see this done much more rapidly, and um, you would see a lot of development and a lot you know and a lot more success in that in that um, you know on that continent if, if if this was done, so a unified. Um, Common market, um, um, a um, almost like a EU, an AU, you know, and a um, and a, and 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 a and a, common, and, and, a, and, a and a unified dollar. You know, I know that that wouldn't be the exact perfect answer, but it would certainly be way some states would be would have to cover other ones that would be a little less um, um, a, a little a little less capable, but you know, your dollars would be backed up in gold and not in faith and some of this other bullshit that you could get into a lot of um, speculations and really get into a lot of problems. So um, it, it, it would, you know, and that would also encourage states to be better run and have proper type of leadership and reduce a lot of corruption to where um, you, you would, could you could really maximize on your on, on your people's dollars and, and put together projects and so forth. That would, that would really help to build and then, and, um, and, and, and strengthen, you know, your, your state as well as the continent. But um, that's, that's, that's my thinking on that. What do you guys think? Man, you, you hit the nail, uh, proverbial nail on the head. I mean, you, you get one shot. He's like a man building a house and hit the nail once and it went all the way into where he wanted. It's yeah, like, it's, it's, it, it's not possible for the state of Mississippi to negotiate with the EU. Mm. You understand? Mississippi or Alabama or uh, even Florida. And Florida has got a pretty good economy. It's not possible. And that's what they expect African states to do. And when they come together, like the goals is, it's not only do they see that they need us more than we need them. The mentality of the African people will change. They're going to see that they can govern themselves in the state of Africa, country of Africa. My state is part of something bigger. You know, I might live in Uganda, but the, the, when, when, when we go to negotiate with Boeing, say, mm -hmm. we can sit down and tell Boeing, look, you got to build a factory in America, just like China did. China said, Boeing, you want to sell, you want to sell airplanes to China, you got to build this airplane in China. Boeing built the factory, employed the Chinese. The airplane is being built in China. Mm -hmm. That's what African um, states have to do. They have to command. And they can only command when they're all working together. Because one by one, look at what happened to the Middle East. If they observe what happened to the Middle East, America went into Afghanistan, took out Afghanistan, took out Iraq, took out Libya, took out Egypt, one by one. If they were working together, so-called Muslims uh, couldn't happen. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think the decolonization decolon uh, process is um, it's a multi generational uh, agenda. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. Uh, you can do all those things, and it's, it's, the effects won't be felt for at least one generation, bare minimum. Um, but again, uh, we talked about uh, many of the aspects that uh, that go into this, and you're talking about the uh, institution, then you're talking about language, and then you're talking about policies, and then you're talking about innovation, right? The fourth industrialization is, is, is a key component um, to actually ra uh, ramping up the change that they want to see on the ground. And this isn't just for uh, Africa because this is, you know, black cultural intelligence, right? So we're talking about how this relates to you and as well as to multiple cultures uh, across different continents and across the water, right? What we talked about gentrification and how it relates to IDP, right? The international term, which is inter uh, uh, internally displaced people. So internally displaced people in Africa are being shuffled around due to, uh, you know, uh, terrorism and um, uh, all types of uh, uh, political instability. You see the same thing on the ground here in America. You see it in New York. You see a lot of black people being, uh, being ran out of New York by these hipster colonialism that we have in America. Going to black neighborhoods, pale face, Fake glasses from CVS and Walgreens and Dollar General, um, neck beards, trucker hats, skinny jeans with Converse or Vans or some other off-brand, and some big WWF belt on them. And these guys come in, they buy the property for cheap. They sell it. They buy it for pennies on the dollar. Raise up the raise up the price of uh, of the neighborhood to where it's no longer livable for, for the residents, um, which would be the black people. And then those black people have to move to somewhere like Connecticut and New Jersey, where they have no access to the uh, the cultural settings that they were originally born into. Um, and now they're displaced through gentrification. Um, so in order to stem something like this, what we've talked about on here, on this channel, is building up maker labs, building up these institutions, that's going to actually involve the development of innovation um, going forward. And you culturally brand it so that they can't just remove it. In order for them to remove it, they would have to destroy it. And that's not going to happen if, if the people actually stand for something. Well, you know, I mean, you know, th th that definitely is, is a part of it. <laughs> But I think the biggest thing that really the West is afraid of is, is why they went to war against Libya is what I think was mentioned previously about really having an African dollar and unifying Africa that way economically. That's a problem. That's what we Africans have to, ha 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 have to push towards because manufacturing and some of these other industries are going to be moving more towards Africa. It's coming. It's come. It's coming there, and it's, and it's happening there now. And that's only going. That's going to only happen more in the future. So um, the resource game is there. Th this, you know, others are trying to f forward this movement now because they see what what the writing on the wall is. Europe, for all practical purposes, 100, 150 years from now, is finished. So all with right? with that, so. Would that currency, that, that um, one African currency, would that be a local currency or would that be internationally traded on the market? Oh, I think, um, well, that, 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 of course, would be internationally traded. It would be internationally traded, absolutely. So to, to settle debts internationally as well, um, because then that would, of course, give you, you know, um, a lot of uh, influence and so forth elsewhere. So, yeah, you know, that would. At first, I believe, you know, it would start, very heavily within the African continent, and um, and 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 then and then actually branch out. You've got some powers out there like the IMF and others who would be out here trying to um, kind of stop that. But the name of the game is if the states were linked up through confederation um, and, and and African Union, it would put a lot of pressure. 
on on the outside is to, to to play, especially if you're taking a uh, if you're taking starting take a lead or have a presence in the manufacturing aspect of, of, of what's going on, um, all around the world, not only in Africa but throughout Europe and in the Americas as well. So mm-hmm. this is kind of where things are, are are moving. Do you follow what I'm saying, Mike? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, that's really what I'm what I'm trying to say. And as we get into this conversation, let's talk about gold, dollars, and power, you know, of, um, uh, you know, the Dr. Gavin's book, just Gavin's, um, a few years back. Um, that was back, I think, in 2010 or 2011, um, when we start to look at that whole fiat currency game and all that. What was that? Primarily, that was more of a political, you know, kind of, kind of move to put the American dollar, fiat dollar, if you will, currency, to control Europe. And that wasn't so much just that we were rebuilding Europe and helping, but that was politically to kind of keep them from fighting and going at each other again in, in, in a lot of ways. That was used to kind of help to, um, to, control, to control the European continent, without question. That was a very big part of that. We can get into that in much deeper detail, but that's what these currencies really are, are even though the plan and how that was laid, was laid out wasn't really that great. It was more of a political type type of movement. I'm looking at that in the same way in Africa. But the Africans, if they generate this, it would be very strong politically. That would have a lot of influence over the leadership of many of these nations. And it would have a very strong political effect um, internationally. And, um, of course, the economics, of course, is going to roll right, right with that because they're going to move hand in hand. But um, um, that's a, a key piece as far as a little, bit, a little bit different than what we're talking about in Europe. But, but here, that, that would be used as a method to, to strengthen the continent and, um, and to um, reduce certain levels of colonialism um, and, and see to it that that, that, that doesn't rise again. Um, so I think... Um, I mean, this is, we're talking some fairly heavy shit here right now, but I'm just saying we can get into this a lot deeper, but I just want to touch on that, if, if you follow where I'm coming from on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Andy in the chat says um, Mohammed uh, Gaddafi got murdered because uh, he wanted to unify, he wanted to unite Africa, should be unified, uh, African currency that is backed by gold. So the central bank is watching. Not so much the central bank, but the but the French banks and the French government is watching that. The French is, is worried right. that their that that their uh, imperialism in Africa that right. uh, helps them stay afloat uh, would would come under scrutiny. It would collapse their economy overnight. Europe would be in chaos right. if Africa comes up with their own currency that is that is uh, uh, a united currency. They they would go to war for that. We met, in war. I mentioned that already. I mentioned that before when, when I mentioned that. I mentioned that. That's why Libya you know, got hit. That's what they were trying to do, um, of which has caused other issues. Because what did that do? Even though they did that, it brought in a greater influence uh, of Russia and of, and of China. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so what, what is that really saying? With your war and so forth, you, you really can't hold back the dawn. You can't stop the day from rising. You, you can't do it. You, they're going to try, but they can't. And um, that's kind of what we're, what we're dealing with. This is going to play itself out over the next 100 years or so. Hey. But, 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 but that's, that's where we are. DE, you, you, you have something to say? Go ahead. Yeah, a couple of months ago, didn't the Italian prime minister say he should bring France to the court for, for what it's doing in Africa to the resources in Africa? Yeah. Yeah, because Italy, Italy is getting away from the European Union. European Union is a colonialist project. It colonizes poor Europeans into, into a system that is governed by France and Germany, which is what they don't like. Italy, Poland, and some of these other Euro- poor European countries like Portugal and Greece are saying to hell with this whole entire uh, you know, European Union. Let's get the hell out of here. So they're saying the same exact thing that most Africans have been saying about colonialism in the past. The hell with you. Um, so we, we see that uh, in different ways it affects different people. And that's a part of you know, the cultural intelligence piece. 
how how will people relate to this and how it impacts them and how they can actually um leverage it to their advantage but a lot of people on you know on youtube black youtube don't really understand the significant impact of of, of colonialism um you see some of the, well I, I won't go into it right now because you know that that'll probably get our channel flagged but um the point that i'm making here is that uh the colonialist aspect is not just in africa but it's also here in the united states you see it here in terms of how they govern um black and brown neighborhoods you see how stop and frisk as a policy was used to control um black males uh 80 percent of the stops in new york happened to be that of black males um and we and, saw how that impacted them you're hitting it dead on the head and to even take it at a wider view we can even see where this actually um functions within states here in the union the blacker states uh, as opposed to the whiter ones that's a deeper deeper game and um you know i'd like to get into it but let's mention states like alabama you know mississippi and so forth we can we can really expound deeply there as well but um you know let's you know we'll we'll, we'll table that for for for, for slightly there, Different times since we're talking about Africa right now, but um, but but yeah, that's that's going on here. You have third world nations here. This this, uh, this as as far as they are all concerned, and people to be controlled, and refugees that have been in this country for hundreds of years as well, and that's a deep thing that we want to get ready to get into. But you know, we we we, we did see some of that, and what I found rather interesting was what we saw certainly during um Katrina. But anyhow, but anyhow. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I want to say something here. One of the pastors that we forget that African leaders are morons, but you got to look at African leaders as non African because they're, they're black skin, mm -hmm. but the internal organs are all French, British, or, and some of them American now. If you look at the Egyptians, because the guy who's running the country, where did he go to school? You know what I'm saying? But this is where cultural intelligence comes in. Because when you start to see yourself and your culture as being worthy and still call yourself a Francophone mm -hmm. or a British, you know, you gotta you gotta <laughs> you gotta get rid of this mentality. You gotta see how things were done to you. Like Mike read all these articles tonight that showed how the British, the French, the Germans, all these people manipulated the continent throughout the years to bring, out, uh, bring about this. We are, we are French, so we got to support the home country. Or we are British, so we got to support the queen kind of mentality. Mm. You know, but the uh, philosophy you that the Europeans was built on, their philosophy, their art, their technology was all built up what came out of Africa. They just changed it, in, and we talked about that today. They just changed it, and now we think that they are the greatest. And they're not. It's the technology that they have. But if you go back in our past, you see that their present is built on our philosophy. Our you, 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 you definitely see that, and it's, it's, it's coming full circle around. When we start to talk about the whole Brexit and all that. One of the key things that we saw, and we all talked about, we broke it down politically and sociologically and started to take a look at what was happening in, in, in England. And then we look at this, you know, this, this prince who's running around who was wearing a Nazi uniform, uh, you know, at, at a party one time, marries a black woman or a blackish woman, if you will. She was supposed to represent a black person. What was that about? That was a political marriage. Why? Because they're saying Brexit may be some total bullshit. We may not be able to totally survive this. So we're going to go back to our old Commonwealth countries. We can't now come in like the we can't come in like the uh, conquerors, but now we're going to have to come in with the now of a you know kind of a common market union with these Africanized and Caribbean countries to kind of get our economy and and, and we have to break bread with these guys. So we're going we're going we're going to marry you know we, she's going to be white looking, but we're going to have to bring some blackish up. We have to bring some blackish up in here because this is how things are going. You got to look at what's going on. You got to look at who's starting to make some moves here. The Italians are sitting here saying, you damn right. Mike, you brought up a wonderful point. Yeah, yeah, hell yeah, man. Uh, 
they don't they they they've been colonized because the Italians and others they want to go into other markets that they can work with. They don't have to come in as colonizers, but they have other markets that they can begin to sell their product to instead of being squeezed out uh, over here in Europe. They can go Africa and Asia. These are huge markets that they can get, get involved in and equal and trade as equals and well, make a great deal of money and step off from the colonial game that's being played um, 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 on, the, on the colonial continent um, of, of Europe by, um, by primarily Germany. France is being propped up, all right? And England is, is, is teetering, you know, looking to, make their, looking to make their own move. You have to look at Europe for, for, for where it is. Anyway, go, go ahead, Mike. Now, I was just going to say that um, the euro has crushed all, all the other uh, um, countries within the union that have signed up to this. That's, that's why correct. it was going to be a good idea that, to, have one curren- to have one currency. There, therefore, this would be beneficial for them. But in reality... It has not been beneficial for them because the one currency has killed any sort of competition from other neighboring states. So instead of having these individual currencies where you can have um, different valuations of, of, of the currency itself so you can compete for contracts and manufacturing and things of that nature, you can't compete against the Germans because they're, they're a uh, well-oiled machine. And all of the economic and and technological and manufacturing power is in Germany. So what happens when you're Italy, Portuguese, uh, Portugal, uh, Italy, and uh, and, uh, uh, Spain? You you can't compete for contracts because your labor is not it costs the same as Germany, and you don't have the same um, benefits. When you look at um, Spain, or you go into um, Italy, and so forth. They don't have large, giant manufacturing plants. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, they don't have that like Germany does. Germany, huge in, 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 um, in um, uh, just manufacturing, not only just, you know, um, you know, you know uh, tools and dive, but, but big in the computer industry as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and they create a lot of product. You know, and they make a lot of product for, um, for uh, even for China and so forth. I mean, they're doing, you know, for China, you know, the products that go that go to China. You think China's in there, but oh, but Germany, you know, and in, in your in your uh, in your cell phone, you know, um, the technology where you move your phone around and it keeps its, you know, its its position of of of, of the picture and so forth. All, all you know that that that's those it's are right. microchips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, these are microchips that are uh, that are designed in in Germany. Siemens. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, um, and so forth. So, I mean, you know, they're, they're very strong there. So, a lot of these other countries do not have an opportunity to really compete. So, where can they go and you know create product and then you know move into another you know uh, and have other markets to open into? Where can they open up this? The, you know, you know, where they can be more competitive. How how can they do that? And uh, they're gonna they're gonna have to look towards Asia, Africa. You know, uh, work with them. And, and, and really try to build a larger, you know, you know um, manufacturing base in that country and have to work with African countries as well. But they're being shut out. They're being closed down in Europe. It's, it's definitely a colonial game there as well. The currency yeah. should not operate like that, but that's exactly what, uh, how, you know, you know, what the fiat currency was, was designed to do uh, um, well, b- by Bretton Woods and so forth as, 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 as we you know, you know, get deeper into that and, and understand that this, this was that was about this was it was this is what this was about, and um, um that, and it that, that's go ahead. no, I was just gonna say that's what Hitler got in the end, right? Hitler wanted yeah. to uh, to be the center of power in Europe, and that's and Germany eventually became the center of power in Europe after uh, what maybe uh, between from nineteen forty five until. 1991, they had to wait until after 1991 to become that, that center power. Uh, you, know, you know, but it was prognosticated that Germany would, would have been that power back in the 20s. Mm-hmm. And they understood that. But, but, the, but, but Hitler and his crew and how they came in, the gangsters came in and said, we, we, we want this now. And, um, you know, they had, they, had a, they had a technological edge then. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and they created, you know, a, a tremendous army, you know, uh, with great technology. And we can look at some of the technology that um, that they talk about, and there's rumors of other things that these guys were dealing with that, that were at, at fairly advanced levels that we're still dealing with th- to today. So they, they, they were on top of some heavy duty stuff. Um, they, were, they, were, they were destined to kind of be the leader. They didn't have to actually go to war and do what they did. 
to be leaders because look where they are still now. And they, 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 they had the leaders there. Um, so they didn't have to do that, but, but they did this um, just because, you know, they were savages. But I mean, to say for that, I don't know what else, I don't know how else to call it. But, um, but, 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 but that's, that's how that went down. So, uh, you know, and then, you know, we got involved and, you know, and then the whole game after the post-World War II era and how we reshaped the whole game from there. And, you know, and, um, and yes, and, and, and the currency and the dollar and all that um, was designed for, for us to be preeminent, um, which we're dealing with today, but it's starting to teeter. And um, it's starting to teeter. There are the muscular rivals on the scene now. And, um, and Africa could be in a wonderful position if they could hang together and bring a 50, uh, what, 54 states, uh, I, I believe. And, 55. Um, country, 50, 55 states now. Um, Soon to be 56. Right. Um, uh, to, 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 to link up and, and join. And I think war is going to be the end. War is not going to be the answer for that. It's going to further destabilize things. So it's not the answer. There's going to be certain things. You just, you got to deal with certain realities. Europe, which is really at the, at the break of breaking ranks, from some of this um, a- aggressive um, uh, hegemony for, from the United States to say, oh, we, we got to survive. We, we, you know, you know, we, we got to do certain things. Even Britain, they said, they, they're teetering with this and they're dealing with um, their old Commonwealth buddies uh, now to try to see if they can put together a, a, another British Commonwealth, you know, where they can do business. Well, um, they, it's already established. Yeah, yeah. Fifty five so, I mean, states it's fifty five states within the British Commonwealth right now. Well well, here we go. So <laughs> so yeah, I'm just saying this is this is what's going on. I, I just what I'm I'm saying is I just, you know, want people to start thinking a little a little bit, you know, broader and actually what's going on, you know, as opposed to some of the um some of the cacophony of of, of, of the foolishness that that, that, that that I um hear, you know, on YouTube. You know, and uh, not only in the black sector, but in the white sector as well. Um, so, um, yeah, it, 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 mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I think um, when you really put it in perspective and how a- Africa can actually um, decolonize themselves, um, they have to look at the innovative part, uh, portions of, of their economy. I think two thirds of Africa right now. Uh, population is under the age of 35. So they have a lot of millennials. A, a good portion of their continent is made up of millennials who have no place else to go. And then you have, uh, they, but they're technologically savvy, right? So they have, okay. they, they have the ability to work a smartphone, a ThinkPad or, or a tablet or something like that. Um, and their mind is right for writing code. Uh, the quickest way to, uh, create infrastructure is through coding. Uh, coding is the new infrastructure development. So when we have these conversations about decolonialism, you, gotta, you, might, be, you might have to technologically code your way out of this. Um, that, 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 that's very accurate, Mike, and, and, and you're hitting that right in the head. And let's also talk about some of the, fast and grow, some of the fastest growing middle classes on earth right now are... Um, are um, I'm sorry, I apologize if somebody's coming across, like, coming over here. Um, uh, some of the fastest growing, up to, uh, excuse me, um, you just go around. Oh, fuck. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Um, some of the fastest growing middle classes are actually, uh, are actually growing in Africa. You know, I mean, they're, 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 so there's a lot going on that maybe a lot of us do not, are not aware of. Um, um, but, you know, I think it's within the brain trust interest to continue to have these conversations to make, start making people aware, more aware. Yeah, I would also I would also add into that. Um, I saw that uh, somebody posted in the chat about Swahili being considered as uh, um, the default language on the continent. Uh, I, I think that's going to be a strong move because um, once you remove the um, or once you include, you know, the uh, the language, you know, linguistics is important. We did a whole hangout on on language and travel. Um, and, and how that can, you know, can broaden your cultural intelligence. This is going to cultivate more intelligence um, on, on the ground with, with your people. If you can cultivate people, uh, your, your people's intelligence through linguistics, you know, that is a strong move because the oppressor doesn't even understand the language um, unless, unless you have uh, someone interpret it for him. But for all intents and purposes, 
um, your own intelligence um, base is going to come from linguistics first, and then um, the innovative aspect comes afterwards, right? So um, building more technocrats, um, you know, to subsidize, uh, uh, to create this sort of e in environment in, the, in this economy that you're trying to compete in is going to be a strong move. I also think that it would be, I also think that it would be uh, incumbent upon them to actually go out and fight for Haiti and, and fight for some of these other Caribbean countries that are uh, being left to ruins by Western powers because of the uh, their geographical location in, in the in the alley of a hurricane. Um, a lot of the times, you know, these uh, tourist resorts and, and and attractions actually benefit Western Western governments and powers. But then, when when the, when the chaos comes from uh, Mother Nature, they don't get the support that they need. So if they're not, what's the point in being a um, a uh, a ward of the state if you're not going to get any um, any benefit from it? Go ahead, De. You was going to say something. Oh yeah, I was going to say um, uh, something about when you mentioned something about. Uh, when you were mentioning about the language, mm -hmm. um, you got people in Mozambique who can't speak to people in Ghana, and they can't speak to people in Ethiopia. So <laughs> when you can't talk to your neighbor, it creates more of a problem for both of you. It creates a problem for both of you mm -hmm. because now you you can't communicate. You can't communicate, so you can't express you know if your neighbor does something or you like something that your neighbor does you can't talk to him because he's going to look at it as a what mumble jumbo you, you know you know something's wrong with you you know what i'm saying mm. so that's the nature of people but when you speak the same language and you can say hey you got a nice garden you know if i can't i can't express myself what am i you know and that's one of the problems we have the second one is that Say um, there was not one language in, in Africa. Mm -hmm. All the students, wherever they go to school, gonna learn that language. It's like a, a kid from California can go to Harvard, or a kid from Boston can go to um, University of California, mm -hmm. some uh, UCLA, and they speak the same language. They don't have to worry about going to France to learn something when somebody in Ghana can teach it mm -hmm. or, or somebody in Ethiopia can teach it. But you go into France, you know, because you speak French. Or you go into the, the military academy in, in, in Britain and your neighbor is going to the military academy in France. And when you get home, the two of you can't talk to each other because the, fr the French teach taught him one one um, uh, way of thinking, and the British taught your neighbor a, a separate way of thinking. And now the two of you can't get along unless you really, really, really intelligent people say, you know what, this is my neighbor. I have to be able to talk to him. Well, you know what? That comes from technological innovation. How do you, let's say you have a smartwatch, right? It runs a little mini operating system, and it has a microphone to it as well as uh maybe maybe even a small webcam you when a person speaks your neighbor whether it's mozambique and ghana and they both hold their um their uh you know their com, com, um their beads like in uh black panther and they speak into it and they open up their palm and then a, 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 a hologram pops up and it interprets the language for them on the fly because they have that dictionary, they have the linguistics database already built into the into the beads for all fifty five nations. That makes it easier to do business. These are these are you know socially impacting um, changes that can be happening on the it's ground. Nothing much. How are you doing? Good to see you. Yeah. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, these are. Um, you were talking about just now, and the goal too. He was saying, uh, you were saying that it's going to take about one generation to make these changes, and mm -hmm. and that's the reality of 
you just have to you have to start somewhere it's like you're building a house it's going to take you 30 days or whatever the case might be no matter you're built as long as you're going to start from scratch to build a house it's going to take you that amount of time so you better well start now if you start now you end it a week if you start a week later from now you're going to end it a week later so if you start now you end it a week earlier and that's what they have to do that's the, that's the kind of planning they have to put in this you know what we're going to do this that we're going to start doing this today and by 2040 we'll have this thing together or almost together to a point we're going to work out the, the small details by then mm -hmm. so how this relates to people locally here in america right black people here in america um because in it's going in, in my opinion it's going to give a lot of black people here in america the faith to then there are some black people who are never going to go to africa it, it, we were talking about that last night on what's the it's, it's like some people who are never going to separate who will have never separate mm. because they're never physically separate they, they're just thinking in the physical manner mm -hmm. but then there are others who whose mentality is say you know what i can do this and you're looking for those people who are going to say you know what oh man africa is changing mm -hmm. you know what it's at a point now where i feel comfortable that i can go i feel comfortable that i can maybe invest i feel comfortable you know what shoot i mean those well, i'll go over there and look at, look around and see what happens you go over there you might get married you won't be scared now to marry an african woman or maybe a couple african women <laughs> serious you won't be scared to do it but now you're scared because you don't have that that cohesion, you know what I'm saying? And language is one of the language drives that, you know, when they when they see that they can they can go there and wherever they go on the continent, there's just one language. So if I were to learn that one language, I don't have to learn a thousand dialects of of uh African village, you know what I'm saying? Well, let's just say this. Stronger. This could be this could be solved pretty easily. I mean you know, Europe has done it. You know, Europe, you know, Europe, you have all these different, you know, languages, you know, in, in, in Europe. And, you know, English tends to be, you know, a common language. I think a common language, I think in Africa would probably be English. I think that that is going to be a common language, almost like the Latin of, 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 of ancient times. I, I think that might be a common language. I don't think that the language barrier is going to be anything that that's going to stop people from from, from working together and, and doing what they have to do, but uh, that's an easy enough problem to solve. It's easy, that's an easy enough problem to solve, I, I do believe. Even though you go deep in the in, in, the, in the backwoods and you're going to have all these different uh, dialects. I mean, I, I know of Mozambique. You know, they have uh, Ranga. You know, which is a um, which is a patois. You know, you know, sprinkled with Portuguese. You know, um, and uh, you know, it's it's an African language, but it but it does have Portuguese in it. But yet, you know, if you had uh, so you know, they have Creole. Yeah, they 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 have they have a, a Creole language. I mean, so you have all these different languages that, that that are certainly there. But if you had one language that everyone could kind of communicate with, English would be probably the uh, a, a, a common language that everyone could probably rally around easy enough to kind of get certain things done. So I, I don't see that as being a huge a huge problem. I think the biggest issue, I believe, quite frankly, um, on the on the continent is um is really um really, really, really putting together a common market. You know, I think you start, you know, getting a real African common market going, you know, that's going to solve a lot of problems, man. <laughs> a lot yeah. of problems, you know. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, where, Kant where Kantanka is now selling cars in South Africa and, um, and uh, as well selling cars in Zimbabwe and so forth. And then, you know, um, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, other countries, uh, you, you know that, that might be designing cars or computers and so forth, and and selling them around, and you know, you know, at, you know, cheaply, and 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 building up their economies that way, and um, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot that goes with this. Uh, so, I'm just um, you know, anyway. Yeah, ahead. one of the other, yeah, one of the other aspects is that um, that one of the articles we read is that they were using hip hop to uh you know, for political change, you know, to bring down their governments and challenge them, right? So we see 
that culture in America by black people actually being leveraged as a tool, as an instrument to actually challenge and decolonize um, parts parts of the government or even parts of a society over in, on the continent. Uh, I saw that actually even in Europe. Yeah, I saw I, I saw that um, during the Kosovo War, mm-hmm. and saw that there because I was uh, I knew a Kosovo a woman from that area who I was quite friendly with and whose family had come here back, and we had we really gotten into some some, some depth about what had happened there and some families that, you know that, that I know in the area, and um, you know she was breaking out tapes of guy of of, of people in her village actually rapping hip hop about their village and their town and that was used as a um as not only a solidarity but a but, but a way to you know to, to fight and you know and um you know galvanize you know their their forces uh, uh, against their enemies. Uh, this is going on this is going on in Europe in, in the nineties. So I I'm just yeah hip hop is 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 it's been a, a kind of a revolutionary powerful tool. Not so much here where you're you know you know, one of the uh, things that, that I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just want to say, not that you're twerking and ass shaking and all that that is going on over here. Um, we, we de- you know, you're dealing with, um, you know, you have some, some very strong dynamics behind this. So it's, um, it's, 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 it's live. You know, but but great point, Mike. I just wanted to bring that up to say that that, that has it's it's classically been this uh, a revolutionary type of uh, musical lexicon, cool. and um, you know, but but anyway, I'm going behind you, they're going. Um, I, I, I watched how, uh, reggae Mm -hmm. plays a trail across Africa. And I, I, sometimes I wonder why is it that it took that African, African adopted hip hop instead of American, it it came from Africa, instead of American ADOS say, going to Africa and taking um, hip hop there directly. It took you two to bring it there. You know what I'm saying? It, 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 it seemed to be this, this much of a fear factor mm-hmm. in going to Africa that, that you know what I'm saying? It, 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 it's at, at odds in my mind. Why would we? Why would I don't know these these hip hop uh, giants in America not go to Africa and spread the word? Well, Fifty Cent um, and, and and quite a few rappers, Rick Ross and these guys have been to Africa and have made investments over there. So we we know that's happening, and that's happening through Akon. Akon has brought them over there to make these investments. So they they have been over there, but you know. Your your um your KRS ones, your public enemies, they've they've been to the continent. You know, they've done their work in the past, but um in America you can't really say what you want to say in the way that they make you make it seem like with the First Amendment. You know, um you saw what happened with Two Live Crew, right? So what I what I'm saying here is that um hip hop, the cultural form of hip hop and rhyming and, and, and the whole cultural aspect of it has been leveraged by Africans to actually challenge, you know, um, a lot of the institutions, the, the colonialist institutions. Um, so that's another instrument in in the tool bag that uh, many of them can actually use. Uh, we talked about language, right? Linguistics is important. Um, fourth industrial, fourth industrialized um, industries, such as coding, such as autonomous vehicles such as space exploration all of these things come into play when you start talking about um you know uh decolonialization um because like the article that we read uh about a half hour ago was that um you fight you fight the west by using the tools that they use to colonize you um you leverage that to your advantage you, you know um science technology engineering mathematics and, and, and art art Hip hop is a part of STEAM. STEAM, which represents science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics, is a part of that whole entire structure. So there's a lot of information and data that is being uh, presented and needs to be gathered and harnessed 
um, and practiced um, to get to get the most enriched effect out of it. Um, and, and what you see in Black YouTube is that a lot of people are not enriching the content so that it can be leveraged by others um, to do just that. So if anybody wants to get on the panel, um, we can we can send you the link. You can get on the panel. You can state what you want to say. We'll we'll close this out by eleven fifteen or eleven thirty. Um, we would love to hear from some of you all who are in the chat. Um, press one in the chat if you want to get on the panel. Also, I want to touch on the point that Nagone said earlier about um, the Tonkin um, cars being manufactured out of Ghana. I think cars are relevant if you don't have a rapid transit system. And you see a lot of cars in places like, um, in certain places because it, it, in uh, Asia and Africa because they don't have a proper transit system. Once you put a transit system in place, now you have um, less need of vehicles on the road because you can move more people at, at a single time, right? Um, so if you're going to make investments into uh, personal transportation as well as uh, community-based transportation, you got to start thinking about um, next next generation technologies, um, whether it's bullet trains or, in this case, it should be drones, right? A drone that can move eight people at a time comfortably uh, over a large swath of land in, in record time without running into any, any, any uh, traffic on the ground and polluting the air um, is actually going to be really beneficial to them. Yeah, yeah you, you talk about a major infrastructure kind, kind of a move, and I, you know, I would agree with that, Maglev trains and bullet trains and all that. Yeah, that, that, that would play, but I always see the place for a car because, you know, you're looking at the continent, it's a huge, huge, huge place, um, you know, the continent itself. Uh, why swaths of land? So yes, I can, you could definitely see where where the connecting infrastructure would really would really work um, and, and be very efficient. But but you know, moving from small towns, other towns, or whatever, you know, um, vehicles, even um, autonomous driving ones, will certainly uh, ha ha have its place. You know, as you build more roads and and, and, and better infrastructure over the continent over the next, you know, over, you know, over, over the next um, you know few few decades. But, but certainly, I, I could still see where, where cars and, and these types of um, um, vehicles will, will be available. And let's be, just admit, some human beings like to be on motorbikes and like to be in cars, like to control things themselves. So I don't, you know, um, so uh, you know, I, 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 I see, you know, the need for these types of things uh, uh, to be around for, for the foreseeable future. Um, how they'll be powered, the energy systems, and all that. Is, you know, we can all debate that, but I believe that people will be um, uh -huh. certainly still be, be engaging in automobiles and so forth, uh -huh. even with a very ramped up system. Uh, you know, I see people who are in New York City who don't need to have cars, but yet they have cars parked in garages who have money and <laughs> they don't even need them. So if they have to drive out to the country, they, 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 they have a vehicle for that. It doesn't make any sense, but people are doing it. Uh -huh. Anyway. From my experience in Africa, right? Um, what what Mike is saying, yeah, and the going you're correct, but Mike is uh, the coming technology will be good because totally a lot agree. Of Africa is built around village life. To totally agree, totally agree. Yeah. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with him. A lot of Africa is built around village life, and right now the cars and motorcycles that you talk about, that's how they usually get back and forth from the village to the village. Like they might work in, 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 in Lagos, but on the weekend, the rich people are going to fly to Abuja. But the, the guy who's, gonna, who's, gonna, uh, who's got a motorcycle, he's, he's going to go up to his village maybe 10 kilometers away, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, Mike is, is, is drones, it, it might take over from the automobile in the future. But yeah, it, 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 it's inevitable that Uber is working with Bell 
engineering on on their drone right now. This is this is happening yeah. right now. It's already yeah. done. It's already yeah. a done deal. So this is this is a vehicle that's going to uh, revolution um, revolutionize uh, transportation. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just a matter of going into play by 2020. Um, yeah. When you think about Africa, and you don't have to build roads, uh, you know, for personal transportation, you would build it for commercial use because you need to move goods with with the, uh, with these big trucks, you know, tractor trailers. But when you start talking about personal transportation, a drone that is governed by policy um, to land in certain areas and is geofenced, so it doesn't veer off the path and go somewhere far. It goes from one village to another, or it goes from one hospital from a village to a hospital um, and traversing and so on and so forth, that's going to be key in terms of fourth industrial infrastructure development and decolonization because now you're not tied in with, um, you know, with, with the, uh, you know, the, the colonial master's uh, 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 blessing. You, you, you're kind of building out your own future, which is what the, one of the articles talking about um, black people um, need to take, uh, control of their own future by, you know, um, investing in in, in u- utilizing the same methods of uh, colonialization by the West and using those same tools to uh, decolonize themselves. Yeah, to, 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 totally agree, and, and and no disagreement with uh, with any any parts of, of what you said. I I just was just saying, just mm-hmm. you know, I do see where still you know you know vehicles will will will, will have. Some relevance, but yeah, the, the the new technology that's coming about is definitely going to be revolutionizing a, a lot of things. And um, you know, I'm looking, at, I'm looking at other because uh, I I just look at the adventurous spirit of, of, of human being, like jetpacks and all this kind of stuff. People mm-hmm. people like to play with toys, you know. People just like to people like to control vehicles themselves. They just like to do some of this stuff. So I do see that there will will be room for that. But what you talk about and what you're bringing up right now, as far as um, I am aware of that as well. And uh, I'm 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 total I'm in, I'm actually in 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 total agreement. I'm about to drop off for a second, guys. Uh, I'll keep my line open, but I got someone over here. I, I'm just trying to deal with something here. So, yep. all right, let me uh let me, let me I'll get back to you guys in a minute. The biggest change that I'd like to see come is uh those uh, high speed rails like Maglev's that connecting African cities because um. Trains can carry um, uh, uh, more materials than an aircraft. Aircraft can carry maybe 50 tons, you know. But a train, uh, if built on the, pro- the same um, Belt and Road Commission that, that the Chinese have set up throughout Africa, you can transport materials from, from, from Senegal in, in the west to Ethiopia, to South Africa, you know, and if you got a train that can can travel that distance in three days instead of four weeks, you know, on on a, on a truck, and maybe more on a truck because when you got across borders, you can spend three four days, you know, waiting for paperwork. <laughs> so on the train, the train is on the track. Once it's got the right paperwork, once that train leaves the station, it never stops till it gets to the destination. So you might make three city stops in three different African states, and that's it. So you not only going to transport material, but you're going to transport people. Not everybody is going to be having the amount of wealth to travel by, by, by aircraft. So over long distance, you know, you got a high speed train that can travel. 200 miles an hour, you're good. Yeah. Well, well, when you have things like this, what I'm showing on the screen, I'm sharing my screen right now for those of you who are um, not paying attention. That's a gondola lift, right? So you could actually use these to move people around without actually building roads. You understand what I'm saying? So the idea of building cars may not be necessary if you can actually build these sort of gondola lifts like this right here um, that holds, you know, two dozen people at a time. That's two dozen cars that don't have to be on the road. That's a whole entire road that doesn't need to be developed. And these things are autonomous. They kind of work on their own. They don't actually have to have any sort of um, they don't have to have a driver operator. 
they they just work uh, based on the system. The funny thing is that the power cables, if you're using power cables going from long distance, power cables will run on the same uh, <laughs> the same building structure. Right. So you run your fiber optic down it. You run your five G, all four uh, G, five G uh, uh, towers along the same the same exact line. Yeah, that we. But Africa is Africa right now is coming in online, just as these technologies are being developed. Mm -hmm. So, like you said, you don't need the roads. You don't have to build the roads, and then when the roads become obsolete, you got these roads sitting there not being used. <laughs> this is something that really excites me because I'm seeing this technology come in myself. I'm not just reading it about it and say, oh, that's in the future. It's happening now. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you see it right here. This is actually a very good representation in Oakland of a, uh, of the new ballpark um, where they're using these gondola, um, these gondola vehicles. Um, and it holds, you know, one car holds, you know, uh, 24 people in there. Well, if you got, you know, two dozen cars floating about on a, on a consistent basis and, and, um, and it's all automated, do you really need a whole bunch of vehicles on the road? Or do you really need a vehicle manufacturing plant? You got to start thinking about that long term that maybe you might not want to manufacture cars like that. You may want to set up a network of gondolas all across the country that takes people to where they need to go. Yep. So when I think when I said drones, you know, drones would be like the next evolutionary step to a gondola. But a gondola is actually sensible in Africa because you don't have to kill you don't have to kill the road by laying down asphalt and killing the environment. And you get you get to maintain the environment by throwing up these pieces of infrastructure. You throw up the uh the um the um the, the wind turbines and the solar solar panel uh, uh um uh, uh, fields, field of panels, all of this stuff is tied in with the infrastructure piece. Yeah. If, if I'm if I'm if I'm in if I'm in charge of an African country in terms of the technological development, um, and innovation development, this is how I'm thinking. I'm thinking the long term aspect. This is something that's going to last a hundred years. Um, a road might last, um, you know, a hundred years, but it, it also requires a lot of infrastructure. Uh, um, upkeep maintenance um and it may it, it may need to accommodate more or less things um but you know again that, that's 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 my way of thinking yeah, it's, it's actually correct uh, the arbor's road um say i say i-95 mm. the, the amount of repairs that you had to do with that thing over 20 years you know you might have to re replace it in some places Every ten years, because the truck traffic, you know, mm -hmm. we have to replace sections of it and all that. So your maintenance costs, your repair costs, replacement costs, all go all going up. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then when the road becomes obsolete, then you got to replace it with something else. So you may as well put in the the infrastructure for for the plan hundred years. Instead of going halfway and then having to stop and then rebuild again. Yeah, this is going to be amazing stuff. You know, this is the type of stuff that um, I'm talking to people on the ground and we're we're having these sort of conversations um, on a continent. So uh, once I make my trip over there, either by the end of the year or next year, you know, I'll be involved in some of these um, these discussions. Right. Yeah, and I think a lot of people in these in these chats and um, you know, in uh, Black YouTube, you know, they they're not taking this uh seriously enough. You know that this is infrastructure is the investment, and the investment is in the infrastructure. So if you it, it, Africans I spoke to on the ground said they want to do business with Black people in America, but Black people are not organized. In see, the problem is that we got the knowledge. You know what I'm saying? Because you can look back and see America. We are here in America. We, we've seen American history, or we can learn American history. And American history tells that the, the people who start the, 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 the locomotives and the, and the telegraph in America became filthy rich. Mm -hmm. You know, 
the government essentially paid them to build build the system. They made a killing off of it. Mm-hmm. Even today, I mean, it's still big, it's still running. So you you can't look at the you know what's not there. You got to look at the possibilities. What can I put there? And we don't do that. We're afraid to do, uh, not we, but a lot of us are afraid to do that. You know? Yeah, well, the collective, the collective, the, the mindset is not there. It, it's not there. And, and people have been robbed of their um, their confidence in their, in, in their intellectual uh, capacity um, by the situation here in America um, because of the sort of, you know, uh, 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 cultural thinking of, of a matriarchy. That's what it does. A matriarchy robs the men of their confidence in their um, in their sexuality as well as their uh, in, in intellectual capacity as well. So it, it completely destroys them. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just getting in on, on kind of the last bit. It seems to me that maybe a, a, a lot of us uh, just you. I don't know if a lot of people are aware. I think there's a. I think there's a lack of of, of awareness. I mean. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're talking about other things, but but this kind of stuff is not really being, you know, explored at, at, at the level um, that, that, that that we need to, that we need. It's not being explored. Um, yeah, that's because look, every, um, every day we see on the news about Wall Street, we see what's happening in the economy. I mean, people, there's no way you can see that unless you walk around just looking at the the, the YouTube all the time, just texting your friends about dresses and, you know, uh, who you screwed last night. Mm. That's the only way you cannot see what's going on around. And if you work in an office, even the gossip is going to be sometimes about what's going on in the, in the economy. So we, we, it's there. It's just that a lot of us don't really want to think about it. And, and Michael said, you know, that's how we were, were Kind of acculturated, if I can use that word. Yes. We've been we've been taught to think like that, so it's very hard to get rid of it, especially when your mother and your auntie and your, you know everybody thinks like that in the house, and, and when you get out in the street, the women that you meet think like that, you know. So. Well, we've been colonized by the matriarchy, so that's another colonial aspect that we have to deal with. Um, it's different and different than the uh, pale face, but um, I, we gave uh, people the opportunity to um, to get on the panel tonight. Um, I said for you all to put one in the chat if you want to get on the panel, but no one has put one in the chat. So what we're going to do now is just give our closing thoughts, and then we'll um, shut it down. Um, is this it, it for me? I would like to see the African start um, like you're talking about tonight like like the language is one of the things mm-hmm. it will help because um it affords a neighbor a, a better communication with better better communication between neighbors which is in this in this case african state um also um it, uh, it, we gotta learn more about each other. Like the people in, in Ghana, um, they might know about the people in Nigeria, but they don't know about the people in Ethiopia. And and we have to learn that. As like I was saying earlier, a, a guy from Boston would go to, go to school in, in, in University of uh, 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 UCLA, mm-hmm. and a guy from California would go to school in Boston. That's what Africans have to do. They have to, when you when you start traveling like that, you, you the people in Ghana will learn about the people from, from Ethiopia, the people in South Africa. You know, when when you go to South Africa, you'll be welcome. You know what I'm saying? And this is the kind of thing we gotta we gotta kind of spread the word. Well, what the colonial masters are doing, in, in, in the British colonial masters are doing. In their part of the country, and the, the French colonial masters are doing their part of the country. We got to see, compare notes, and say, "Hey, uh, you know, so this is what we have to do to change this." Mm-hmm. 
and language comes into that. Uh, traveling and, 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 and meeting each other comes into that. And it gets easier when you have one state, which is the African. And Nagon, you have any uh, last thoughts before we close out? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, we're going to go check out this movie, Chef, tonight, man. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Hopefully it's all right, man, with Sam Jackson. Man. It looks like it may be some bullshit, but we're going to check it out. But anyhow, um, yeah, my, 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 my thoughts here are, uh, are you know, let's just, I think we need to stay a lot more aware. We need to talk about this a lot more. Um, Africa is moving. We, we need to be on top of this uh, ourselves here. It's African-Americans. We're part of the Africans of the diaspora. We we, we can play a very strong role here, leadership role. I talked to Mike quite a bit about some of the things that are going on and talks to African brothers and, um, and he knows what's going on there. And you got people like Ghana, Dan and others who are going back and forth and there's a lot going on here. So uh, we just have to be, I think uh, there's got to be a lot more awareness and um, the, the more we really push this awareness and just information being put out there, um, I think there, there'll, there'll be those who may be able to get involved. I saw somebody in the chat said something about where can we invest and so forth. See, these are the kind of things that um, we need to, just with awareness, people will start to think. We, you know, I'm going to say this. Some people may not agree, but we have, we're, we're African America has, African America has enormous wealth. We can do certain things with it, all right, compared to other, we have enormous wealth. We can do certain things with this. I and mean, if we galvanize that, we can make, you know, really um, make some immense moves in, in, in the future. That doesn't necessarily mean that you'll fully you know, get the full gain of it, but others, others will, you, your kids, your grandkids, and so forth. You, know, you can really set a lot of things up and work with the people that, that are there. And that will help us here as well. So it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a reaction that goes both ways. So uh, I just, you know, so I, let's keep the information going and, um, you know, just, just keep hanging. This, this was a great hangout, man. Butter leg. Uh, great, great stuff. DE, man. Great, great, great stuff. Mike, awesome. Uh, 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 awesome stuff, brother. Um, you know, it's, that's what I have to say. All right. All right. Thank you all for joining us. Um, please hit the like button if you have not already done so. Uh, share the video if possible. Uh, we'll be back on Sunday with another um, – Hang out as well. Uh, probably do another cultural intelligence hangout on um, on Haiti. So you all have a good night. And if we don't see you, uh, good Father's Day weekend. Peace.